is some of the things that we need to know is we're giving the 88 pound child, but we're gonna have to convert that into kilograms. Or, and the reason why is since the medicine, the directions, and once again, remember, this is not a script actually written by a doctor, so therefore these numbers could be horrendously off since this is just a generic case study, is 3.1 milligrams per kilogram per day and you're told that you're to divide this up to three times per day, or three doses per day, I should say. Not three times, it's three doses. All right. And so they're really wanting to know how many milligrams of ibuprofen per dose. So the other thing to keep in mind is we're gonna to have to remember to go from kilograms to milligrams later. I wish I can get rid of the, there we go, no, no, okay, maybe that will work, I forget, they updated the program, the app I use, and now it's really sensitive in that one corner. <clears throat> so you have to know that conversion factor between pounds and kilograms, like you just do. And so, if you look online, it's one pound is equal to approximately 0 0.45, 0 0.4536 4, 5, kilograms, which would be one kilogram is equal to about 2.2 .2 pounds. Doesn't really matter. This one's giving it to me. And once again, I would give you that conversion factor. I wouldn't have you memorize it for kilograms to pounds. Okay, so. It is one pound is equal to 0 0.4536 kilograms. Okay. <clears throat> so what's one of the first things that we could do right here? What makes sense to do first? Go ahead and convert the pounds, the, the, the mass of the child from pounds into kilograms. That's, that's the big step. And so we would have 88 pounds. One pound is equal to 0 0.4536 kilograms. Pounds would then cancel, so that way it's only left in kilograms. I have to switch back and forth. Once again, calculator. Come on, phone, you can do it. Clear, 88. And always don't take my word for it. You wanna do check, double check my math, just in case I type something in wrong. Which I, that's not right. Clear, 88 times. 0.4536, yes. So I get 39.917 kilograms. So that's, that's, that's the mass of the child, okay? But we're asked to figure out how much of the medicine per dose. So we've got the first step down. The next step is, and you may not be used to seeing it this way, but a lot of times medicine's given this way, where they give, it's the mass of the medicine per mass unit of the um, patient, and then per unit time, so like day or hour or minute or something like that. They do that in a lot of biomedical sciences and biomedical research. So what this means is 3.1 milligrams of ibuprofen for every kilogram, for every one kilogram for this child per day. So what we're gonna do, and I'll switch colors, is we're gonna take the mass of the child, 39.917 kilograms. I'll call them kilograms of kid. And per the doctor's orders here, the fake doctor's orders, one kilogram of kid, or every kilogram of the kid, is supposed to get 3.1 milligrams of 
the ibuprofen. I'll just put med. So this way, kilograms a kid, kilograms a kid, this tells you the total milligrams of medicine that this child will need for that entire day. Once again, we have to, why does it keep falling asleep on me? You can do it. Calculator. Maybe you always multiply across the top and divide by the bottom. So we get clear. 39.917 times 3.1. And at this point in time, I'm not going to round or do much rounding. We'll, I'll write out multiple digits because of the fact that that way will prevent rounding issues. Okay. So that's how much total milligrams of medicine of the ibuprofen in a day. However, we want three doses in that day. And the original question was asking how many milligrams per dose. So we're just going to take this number for the entire day and divide it by three. <clears throat> so 123.7427 milligrams divided by three doses. Actually, that came back to a much more reasonable amount than I thought it would. Okay, 23.7427, divide that by three, and you get, you know, 41.2. And you may get, depending on rounding, it may be a little bit, you know, you may have gotten 41, you may get 41.3. At this point in time, due to the time constraints of the hurricane, you know, we're not going to worry about significant figures at this point. That's why as long as you show your data, show the way that you, your work, I should say, then, um, per dose, then you're going to get at least partial credit. I would be able to see where you made the mistake, hopefully. And then you always circle. I always suggest that you circle your final answer. Oh, just break it down. Like I said, this is probably the most complicated that the dimensional analysis would get with respect to this field, I would think. So, any questions over this problem? Okay. All right. So we're starting the next chapter. Chapter three is on matter and energy. In the future, I may actually try to do some of the videos ahead of time. So I've done that with some of my other classes, so where you can watch the videos that maybe work in class. I just I'm also behind because of the hurricane as well, so. Trying to get it all set up that way, I haven't been able to yet. Some of this should be review in the sense that all, everything, remember, was made up of matter, and that matter, if you get it down to the simplest unit without it um, losing its identity, it's called an element. You can't break it down any further than an element without it becoming symptomatic particles and it's no longer its identity. Okay? <clears throat> right. So, in matter, by definition, was anything that occupies space and has mass. Anything. So, it doesn't have to be visible, as this is pointing out. Some types are microscopic, so you can't see it without magnification, but it's still there because it occupies space. It has mass. <clears throat> so, once again, this is all just a... review of what we did the very first day. Okay. And as you break it down even further, the smallest unit that you can get down to are, are the atoms. Okay. That's the building block of matter. If you break, you can break the atom apart, but once again, it's lost its identity. It's no longer, it's, we're gonna find out, it'll just break apart to its protons and electrons and neutrons. And so it's no longer that element, okay? However, there are times that atoms can come together and form molecules. That's just where you have two or more that bond together, that come together. So that's why, you know, we have water. Water was, you know, is H2O. And that literally means two atoms of hydrogen with one atom of oxygen. They're bound, bonded together. And they're bonded in such a way, geometrically, that it gives it its functionality. So the, what that means is the 
shape that it takes is important. Okay. And so then we just have some pictures here, and this is already available on my fire. The PowerPoint is. So the molecules can be homogeneous, the same throughout, and composed of a single type of atom. So like an aluminum can that we're showing here is made up of aluminum. But then there are also others where they're not. Okay? And so therefore, this is, they're showing rubbing alcohol, but I, I talked about water, where you have a distinct composition and they're in a distinct ratio. So water is H2O, rubbing alcohol is 2-propanol. I, I actually have to draw it out. I don't have it memorized. Let's see. It's 1, 2, 3, C3, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So H8, no, H9, O, 1. Okay. And so I would never ask you to memorize. But once again, they're bonded together, and they're bonded together in a spe very specific structure for it to be rubbing alcohol. You move the, the thing that was in red, this one that's in red, if we just move it over to the end instead of the middle, it's no longer rubbing alcohol. It's a different type of alcohol. So even though it has the exact same number of carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens, the spatial arrangement of it matters. But that's called a molecule. <clears throat> You can actually use different, so this is just different techniques. I've never asked you, you know, to define or to describe how a tunneling microscope works. This shows you that all of them are the same. This is what, nickel versus, this one's really, I think is really cool. I don't know how well it comes up. Because this is DNA. DNA is a huge molecule. Of course, that's the genetic, you know, code. And you can see here that, you can see the double helix if you follow it can see the double helix. <clears> How's <throat> a DNA molecule? Okay. So, like I said, most of this is reviewed from the very first day, very first lecture that we had. And then we have the states of matter. Okay. So all this is leading up to things that we're going to be using later on throughout the semester. So what are the states of matter? Exactly. I heard someone say it. Yay. So we have solids. We have liquids. And we have gas. Yes, there's one called plasma, but that's... Med medically, it's not relevant because it's not the plasma of your blood. It's just another state of matter where it's lost. It's an amorphous, it's lost its shape. <clears throat> okay. And you can have the same. These are physical properties, meaning that you can have the water that's gas, so water vapor, is molecularly the same as liquid water, which is the same as solid water. Which should make sense, you know, if you take an ice cube and it melts, it's still water. So those are just physical changes going from one state of matter to the other state of matter. <clears throat> okay. So what's, what makes it different? What makes a solid different than a liquid versus a gas? What are some of these differences? How compact that they are together, how closely packed together. Mm -hmm. So and the one that's most closely packed is a solid. The one that's the least compact, gas. Yep. All right, anything else? What's another thing that is different about them? What, what about their shape? Do they have different shapes? Solid has a definitive shape, right? What about a liquid? What shape is the liquid? Whatever the shape of the container that it's in. And what about the gas? That's the same, the same thing. Like the gas, like if you release a gas in this room, it will expand to the entire 
volume of the room. It, it goes to the entire volume. The, so that means that, that's another way it's different, it has to do with the volume. A gas has a in, in relatively indefinite volume, it takes a volume of the, con, of the container. A liquid, like if you take 100 milliliters of a liquid and you pour it into another container, it takes the shape of that container, but it still has a definitive volume, and that would be 100 milliliters. A solid has a definitive volume and a definitive shape. Okay. That's not to say that you don't take sand, but what I'm saying is each individual molecule is a definitive shape. <clears throat> and one of the things that sometimes they talk about is called compressibility. You can try to compress a solid, but it's much more limited, whereas a gas is the easiest to compress, like in a piston. Liquids you can compress, but it's a little bit more difficult than gas, but not as difficult as a solid. So those are the the biggies. And so here we've got a picture that shows a lot of this, of what we've been talking about. <clears throat> then your book would just des will describe like the different states, or, like the different subcategories of each of these, especially with respect to solids. I'm going to kind of uh, just briefly, briefly address. And with respect to solids, the two types that they have are called crystalline versus amorphous. Which in case you didn't know, this um, root word or root term morph means shape, like morphology means shape. So amorphous means without. <clears throat> and what they're talking about here is how they're packed together. A crystalline solid is packed in a repeating pattern. And just think of like a snowflake or salt, sodium chloride salt. Um, amorphous means it's not. It's kind of a jumbled mess. It's not a repeating pattern. So that's the one of the examples that a lot of times they like to use, and I don't actually have a picture over here, is sand versus glass. Okay, so silicon dioxide can be both. And if it's amorphous, it's sand. If it's crystalline, it becomes glass. <clears throat> and so that's just what, all of this is just the same verbiage that I've been talking about. It talks about how they're compressible, uh, how things are compressible. <laughs> There's, there's a little picture showing a crystalline solid versus one that's amorphous. So we can see there are these repeating units here. They're repeating in a de definite pattern, and this is without a pattern. <clears throat> okay. Oh, that's just sodium chloride crystal. All right. Um, I'm going to skip to show the gas, what they mean by compressibility. And so this is showing it in a piston. And so that's why if you apply, if you apply pressure to a gas, let's see, so the downward pressure here, you can squash it more easily than you can a solid. A solid is essentially neg negligibly uh, not compressible. Okay. Um, I'll have to check to see. I don't know on the ILOs if they have you guys do like pressure versus volume force. If it is, it's towards the very, very end. We do a little bit with the ideal gas law. Like mm hmm Yeah, we will go over yep, P inert, which is the ideal gas law. I think that's a very, very last chapter that we cover. <clears throat> okay. And this is just a table showing everything or saying everything that we talked about. We didn't talk about the motion, the movement. I forgot to skip over that part. But solid, they can vibrate, but they don't like all of a sudden, each molecules or atoms don't like all of a sudden move drastically. Liquids are free to move around, the molecules are, and then same thing with gas. That gas moves rapidly. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so how can we classify it? There's actually a great flow chart that we'll get to. So you can have something that's pure. The term that they like to use, that I think I've already used it once, is called homogeneous.
Homogeneous means it's the same composition throughout. Homo means same. And so if it's a pure substance, it's by definition, it has to be homogeneous. It is possible to have a homogeneous mixture. Okay? And that literally means that the same concentration of stuff throughout the entire mixture. So the opposite of homogeneous would be heterogeneous. So an example of a heterogeneous solution would be like sand and water. You can shake it up and mix it up, and then it settles out. So there's more sand and dirt on the bottom than there is at the top. Versus if you add just a little bit of salt to water, and it completely dissolves, and you mix it up, it'll be the same throughout. So that, that's actually a mixture, but it's still going to be a, a heterogeneous mixture. Now, if you add lots and lots of salt, it'll start to precipitate out. But if you add just a little bit, you can mix it up in the entire. Okay, of course, there's the element we are talking about with the aluminum can. It means it's a pure substance. It cannot be broken down into anything more simple than that. There are now just under 118 elements of the periodic table. That periodic table that we have on the wall is outdated. <laughs> the reason why is I know that they've come up with number 118, but they are missing one or two that are just theoretical in between the ones that are missing there. And so. <clears throat> okay. And we'll go over the periodic table later. This is helium, like helium gas. Helium gas would be a pure substance. <clears throat> and it's composed only of the element helium. Now, if you have more than one element that comes together to form a molecule, like water, H2O, <clears throat> then that's called a compound. Okay? You have to have a specific ratio. That's what H2O. HO is called hydroxide or hydroxyl. <clears throat> so that's why if it's just one H and one O, then that's different. You would not want to only take the hydroxyl radical, you would die, you know, if you try to drink that in theory. Just like H2O2 is hydrogen peroxide. And so even though it's only comprised of hydrogens and oxygens, it would be bad for you to take in large quantities. There's a trace amount of hydrogen peroxide in your body, but um, as a result of, of metabolic processes, but you don't want to drink it. All right. <clears throat> All right. Now the compounds themselves, you can break water apart into hydrogen and oxygen. It no longer looks like water, but it's still does, you can separate the hydrogens from the, the oxygens through a process called electrolysis. Um, so, but then you couldn't break the hydrogen any further apart because then it's no longer hydrogen. It's what makes an element different than a compound. So this is just showing you the, the picture of water. Okay. Um, uh, just more definitions. A compound is pure substance. A mixture, by definition, means it's composed of different substances, but they are not bonded together necessarily. Not, well, we're going to find out. It's called covalently bonded together. You have something called an ionic. Uh, you, can, you can have partial bonding, but it's not covalently bonded together. <clears throat> so, like, um, well, here, we'll just look at the picture. That's the easiest way to do it. Go air and seawater mixtures because the <coughs> humidity is caused because of that evaporation of the water. So there is water vapor in the air. So what that's showing is the fact that you can actually have this mixture of water. Oh, they actually don't show it there. But of water, of oxygen, of nitrogen. There's this trace amount of argon, all that up in the air, right above the ocean. And then inside the ocean, of course, there's water and there's salt. So sodium and chloride. Okay, so those are all mixtures.
Whereas if we broke it down further, O2, that's oxygen, that would be a compound. An elemental oxygen in its natural form that we breathe. Okay. And then as I mentioned before, you can have homogeneous and heterogeneous. I actually don't like the example of a homogeneous mixture that they use. They say sweet tea, but I don't know about it. Well, first of all, I, I, I use sweet for my tea, but you see, if you dump in enough sugar, the sugar gets it down to the bottom of the sweet tea, and so it's no longer homogeneous, even only if there's a little bit of sugar. Can you actually say sweet tea is a homogeneous mixture? And hydrocarbon is just a fancy word. Like hydrocarbon, example of hydrocarbons would be fuel, like gasoline. That's a hydrocarbon. <clears throat> okay. So, are there any questions so far? So this is the chart that I like because it helps visualize everything that we've been saying in relatively. Hopefully, fairly simple way, we have, whoops, you've got matter. And then you, there are two broad choices that you have with respect to matter. It can either be a pure substance or it can be a mixture of things. So if we look at pure substance, is the pure substance composed of only a single element? So they're showing copper here. Or is it composed of more than one element in definitive ratios? And so that's called a compound. And I think this is sugar. They have sugar cubes. Now, if we look at mixtures, you can have homogeneous mixtures and heterogeneous mixtures. And this example here that they're showing is, is a dilute sweet tea, where we have, you know, only in theory for a homogeneous mixture, if you took a little sample at the top, it would have the same concentrations as it would at the bottom, okay, or anywhere within that mixture. Whereas a heterogeneous mixture, here they've got oil and water, and it's not the same throughout. You can shake it up, and it'd be like the oil and vinegar dressing. You know, you see all little bubbles, and all of a sudden it all starts to separate out. So it's because it's a heterogeneous mixture. All right. Are there any questions over that broad? All right, so. There are two types of properties. Sometimes I've seen people get confused on these. There's a physical property and there are chemical properties. The big difference is a physical property is one that's displayed without changing that substance. Whereas a chemical one, for you to see that property, it, the substance changes from, one form, uh, changes from one thing to another. I should say one form to another. From one thing to another. So a physical property, for example, would be boiling point. Water, if you take liquid water and you heat it up and it boils, it's still liquid, it's still water, it's no longer liquid, it's gas. So that's why boiling point would be a physical property. Chemical property, though, would be like a reactivity. Like if you took wood and you burn it, that's combustion, it's no longer wood at the end. Okay? You have new carbon dioxide, you have water, and you have well, the ash is left behind as well. <clears throat> so if we just did, the, so this smell, odor, is odor going to be a physical property or a chemical property? Let's say that my child has just gone to the bathroom and disinfected. And let me tell you, it can really stink. Is the smell of his dirty diaper, is that a physical property or is that a chemical property? It's a physical property. It's just that's, it, that smell is based off of the components that's there. And it's, not, it's not indicative of a chemical reaction. <clears throat> Whereas if you have, if you take an iron nail and you stick it outside, especially here in Florida, what's going to happen to the iron nail? It's going to rust. And it changes from Fe, iron, to an iron oxide, Fe, O. Okay. And so that's why that's a chemical reaction that has occurred. 
So we have some pictures. Um, and they've already talked about the odor of flammability, that's how, how it combusts. Reactivity, chemical reactivity would be a chemical property. Um, so this is just a little picture to show. This is a much better job than, than if I tried to draw it myself. Okay. So when they say state changes, you know, from solid to liquid, liquid to gas, or you can go from solid to gas, um, or gas to a solid as well, where you can skip one phase to another. Um, all of those are state changes, and all of those are always going to be physical properties. <coughs> Okay, so here's the iron. Uh, I'm sorry, the iron, the iron, and iron three oxide, which is technically rust. Mm -hmm. So, if a chemical changes the screen, call it a chemical reaction. The whatever it was before is called the reactant. Whatever it was afterwards is a product. I apologize if I use the term substrate. In the biochemistry, a reactant is also called a substrate. Okay, so once in a while I may just you can always correct me or whatever. But uh, uh, and sometimes you see chemistry as well. But in biochemistry, a lot of times we, we see substrates instead of reactants. But reactants are products. Now there are certain types of chemical reactions that are reversible, so therefore they can go backwards. And what happened in the product before can come back and make the previous reactants. <clears throat> okay. All right. Uh, there's a lot of words. I hate text heavy slides. Okay. But the take home message here on this slide is what's italicized. Especially, especially this right down here. If you have a chemical change, you always have a new substance. Okay. Now, one thing that we'll, we may discuss later on, and if you go on to take, some people may decide to go on to take um, chemistry one or chemistry two or something. You want to go even higher. Um, there are electrochemical reactions too, which is where, for example, iron becomes iron three plus. That's still the chemical reaction, chemical change, because it's going from elemental iron to an ion. So we'll talk about a little bit, I've got a chapter, chapter four or five, I think, when it comes up, a little bit about another lot. That's still a chemical reaction. <clears throat> if you lose or gain electrons. Okay. All right, so this is just to show a little picture of, uh, of you know, of the reaction going on, a physical change. Okay. Okay. All right. If we go back here, we can see that this is only a physical change because if you open up that lighter and you don't add the spark, you know, it gives off a certain smell, and that's the smell that you are smelling as the butane. So it's just butane vapor versus butane liquid. However, the and so what they're trying to show here is that there are two, in the lighter here, which they didn't, I don't think they do a very good job, they show that they're, they can show both a physical and a chemical reaction, or a physical change and a chemical change. You add that spark, it combusts, and now it's giving off, and these are completely different things. The butane is being transformed into water and carbon dioxide. And so that's why they're just trying to show the fact that you can see both. <clears throat> um, another process is called distillation. And this is related to like a distillery, uh, for anyone who knows what that is. Um, but all, all you're doing is you're taking your liquids, and this is usually a mixture of liquids. You're heating it up, and since they have different physical pro or they can have different physical properties, like different boiling points, Whatever has a lower boiling point will boil off first and changes from a liquid to a gas, and then it cools off in the condenser back to a liquid, and so therefore you get a more um, pure liquid at the end.
So this is one way that, for example, you could boil alcohol, some alcohol out of water, because alcohol has a lower boiling point than water. Okay, or acetone, acetone, which is like female polish remover. And so it's boiling point's like 50, 50 something, I think, degrees Celsius, whereas water is 100. So once you got to that point, that 50 whatever degrees Celsius, the acetone will start to boil off. It rises as a gas. Then it comes down into the condenser where we have cool water going flowing in, so it lowers the temperature, and then it comes off as we'd have a more pure acetone down here and from the original water mixture. Okay. This is also one of the ways to like purify, you know, salt water. Take the water from salt water because the salt will be left behind. You boil the more pure water off. <clears throat> Okay, and then there's filtration. So for those who go in the lab, I don't know what labs you're able to do this semester, um, or if you go into digital chemistry, but usually you do at least some type of filtration, which physically separates things off, um, the solids from the liquids, because it gets stuck, you know, like the coffee filter, it gets stuck up in the top, the solids do, and the liquid's flowing through. Okay, all right, so now we get to Two important concepts, and what they do is they take these two laws and they mix them in together. Okay, those are the laws, the law of conservation of mass, and then there's one that we will cover later called the law of conservation of energy. So many times what they do, thanks to Einstein, is we put the two together and call it the law of conservation of mass and energy. <coughs> okay. So what happens is. There, we are not God, we do not create things, so therefore, there is no overall change in matter. Okay? What you start off with before, if we started off with two oxygens and two hydrogens on the reactant side, you're going to have to end up with two oxygens and two hydrogens on the product side. Okay? The exception for that would be in some type of nuclear reaction where you can literally change it by taking two different atoms, smashing them together so hard, or things something to break them apart to where it takes um, and it changes it from to two different atoms. Okay, and so I mean, is you still have the so same total number of electrons and protons and stuff like that, which unfortunately we don't get to talk about nuclear energy here or nuclear reactions here, but um, overall you still have the same mass. Okay. <clears throat> All right, and so uh, when it says significant changes in mass can occur. That's how we get nuclear reactors to work. What happens is, and the kind of nuclear reactors that we use are called um, fission reactors, and so it takes a heavy element, like uranium, and it bombards it with a neutron or something like that, and it causes it to break apart to two smaller, small, uh, two smaller elements. But what happens is there's a slight difference, or there's a difference in the mass, and that difference has to give up in energy. That's what's called law of conservation of mass and energy. So if you take the total amount of energy and the total amount of mass in the beginning, it has to equal their sum in the end. You can't ignore it. <clears throat> okay. So this is just a little example of that. Use that cigarette lighter. Please note that there is showing the law of conservation of mass here. The overall combined mass is 266 grams whenever they were reactants. The combined mass overall is 266 grams. An ideal perfect world, you know, that they were able to capture all of the gas. It's in a closed system. I say that because if it's in an open beaker or you like this, use your lighter and you open it, the gas is gonna escape and so what you left behind will look less than 266 because you weren't able to capture all the gas. <clears throat> but the makeup is different. And so the butane was 58 grams, and those, that's carbon and hydrogen, and the oxygen was 208 grams. Now the oxygen is in the carbon dioxide, and it's 176 grams. Okay, and, and there's one oxygen in water as well, okay, which is 90 grams. So, which will, when we balance chemical reactions in a future chapter, that will make much more sense. What you would see is this overall, the total number of carbons on this side have to equal the total number of carbons on that side. 
total number of oxygens and hydrogens on this side have to equal total number of oxygens and hydrogens on that side. Okay. Are there any questions so far? So, let's so, carry on with that. Then there's energy. And the technical scientific term for energy, or definition of energy, is the capacity to do work. You know, unless it was like a, I would never ask you to memorize that, unless it was like a, you know, multiple choice or something. That, that's that kind of question, maybe, but I wouldn't ask you to, in your own definition, you know, use your own words to describe what energy is. Whereas work is defined as force acting on a distance. And this overall comes down to a formula which we cover later, I do believe. Oh, whoops, sorry. And so it's from Einstein. Here, relativity. Um, and that's energy is equal to mass times the speed of light squared. And so that literally means that energy itself can have mass, can have a mass value to it. And so that's how you can convert some mass into energy. Okay. So that's just a, that's why there's a law of conservation of mass and energy. <clears throat> you, do, you are not expected to be able to use that equation at this point in time, okay? And so let's just show you that what they were saying is that you, energy is neither created nor destroyed. It can only change from one form to another form. And one of those forms it can change into is mass or be derived from can be mass. Okay. All right. Are there any questions so far?